see that my curse. Oh, a red dot. I just think that's a yes. Up. Yep. Okay. okay. Good. Great. 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 Um, I'm hoping my, um, I'm trying to advance the presentation and I hope that. Yeah, that would be good. You know, I can, yeah, we'd have I to talk. Yeah. Wake up. There we go. Okay. Um, so thanks to everybody again for having us. Um, do this. We are really thankful and um, always learn stuff by talking with you guys. Um, here's our agenda for today. Again, we, we talked about uh, using cu curriculum planning matrices, identifying appropriate intervention strategies, using implementation checklists to support the fidelity of, in, of um, intervention, and reviewing responsibilities of the consulting team. Um, so here's the chart, um, the Chevron chart that we affectionately call this, um, that that gives you an overview of the nine steps. And if you remember the last time we met, we talked, we went through the nine steps um, very quickly. And, um, and so we want to spend more time on steps four, five, and seven. Uh, and then hopefully the next webinar, we'll talk a little bit more about progress monitoring, both progress monitoring and monitoring the fidelity of um, intervention. Um, and my slides don't have numbers on them, Bill, so. Um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you when I'm ready to jump. Okay. Good. You're good. Keep rolling. Run. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, if you remember back from the chart, the fourth step that we've talked about that's really important after you identify those high priority IEP objectives is to identify specific learning opportunities that can occur in children's daily routines. And, you know, I wish that we had come up with this tool. Um, we didn't, but um, friends of ours, colleagues of ours, Jennifer Grisham, Christy Preddy Kronzak, um, um, came up with this curriculum, I think they called it an activity planning matrix. And the purpose of which is to identify specific routines and activities where teachers can, can embed IEP focused intervention. And it's important to think about specific classroom um, or child care. If you're working in an early childhood program, we kind of use those terms interchangeably. Um, decide on specific classroom routines and activities within which it's reasonable and, um, and, and seems to be effective to embed interventions. Um, if you remember, a routine-based or an activity-based model for in intervention is really something that um, acknowledged as best practice or recommended practice, practice in the field of early childhood special ed or early intervention these days. It focuses on the child's or the student's daily routines or activities like snack, circle time, uh, dramatic play, academic instruction, or so on as a context for learning and, learning and an opportunity for embedding intervention. So in Instead of, um, you know, pull out your math books or pull out your um, science books or something like that, within early childhood or preschool education, we really focus on the routines and activities that children are likely to be engaged in and looking at those as a context for intervention. Um, teachers give children opportunities to practice those goals and activi activities during the daily routines or, or, um, or instead of creating special instructional time. And that can be really important when we're talking about inclusion because we're not really asking general preschool teachers to pull, pull children aside or to pull them out of the room or to have interventionists come into the room. We're talking about engaging with children in IEP-focused instruction within the context of activities that just occur naturally across the, throughout the day and across the week. 
and here are the some of the activities that we're talking about um and you know you you guys are preschool people so we all know the benefits of um routines like playtime reading either large group or individually um, large group singing songs eating um, resting self-care skills transitioning and other types of activities that occur during the day so how does the routines based approach help young children learn well for three um three reasons or or three ways in which it really helps young children learn the first is that children tend to learn best when they're interested and motivated we know that's true of all human learning but perhaps young children most of all um, you know they haven't oftentimes developed the self-regulation skills to be able to um, turn off outside stimuli or things that are interested in, you know, other things that they're interested in. So we really have to be careful to um, think about activities and learning experience, experiences that are interesting and motivated to, to, excuse me, interested and motivating to children. Um, kids also learn best when they have opportunities to learn and practice skills throughout the day. Remember we talked the last time, Bill talked about distribution of learning distributed versus mass practice and how important it is to really think about distributing learning across the day as opposed to just trying to squeeze it all in at one period of time and finally um, it's really difficult for busy teachers to take time out of their classroom schedules to provide special instruction to meet children's learning needs all right i'm up Lori. thank you Okay. So with that introduction, um, we're going to spend the first uh, part of the seminar, the webinar on the how to use the curriculum planning matrix and uh, with some concrete examples of, of what kinds of uh, uh, analysis and thinking goes into developing a curriculum planning matrix. So the key feature of the matrix is what we're trying to do is is help our partner teachers identify learning opportunities in in their daily routines. Uh, part of that uh, assurance is, is to uh, confirm for the partner teacher that she doesn't have to turn her curriculum upside down. What she's doing now with typically developing children in inclusive classrooms or, or your 50-50s or 33-67% ratio classes, the, the typical preschool curriculum will be the foundation for addressing IEP objectives and we'll figure out a way to address those objectives by looking carefully at what kinds of routines and activities occur and how we uh, can address those IP objectives within those routines. So, um, uh, Lori, next, please. I'm working on it. Yep. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. You're, uh, nope, that's not it. I it's, know. Uh, it's, oh, okay. I know. Sorry. Somebody want to mute their phone? Bill, I'm so sorry. This is not being responsive to me. I'm still I'm right. working on it. OK, all right. We're at a construction here momentarily. Um, <laughs> well, that's more than we need to know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Susie, I think that you're sharing your screen. Ah. Sorry, I, I don't know what's happening here. Let's see. Let me let me go back, Lori. I'll move it back a couple of slides. Yeah. Did we already okay, do forward. this? Forward. Yeah. Uh-huh. Keep going. Keep going. Stop. Perfect. 
this is a this is an example of um, a pretty detailed analysis of a, of an activity. In this case, it's pancakes. This was for the benefit of I think it might have been Beth Leaf and and that team uh, who had raised questions earlier about. Uh, how can you address the IP objective of kids with more significant disabilities? Um, I'll go through that in a second, but to point out that uh, this particular analysis isn't isn't focused exclusively on kids with significant disabilities, but we put it in here to show you um, how once again, if we we look at a typical activity and we and we drill a little deeper and we look at the characteristics of the kids in the classroom, um, we sometimes can come up with ways to um, engage those kids with some basic adaptations or accommodations of, of the activity. So in this case, uh, and also there's the other overlay of addressing some you know, high level, typical early childhood education objectives. So in this case, um, it's you know an adaptation of a pancakes activity and you can see the materials listed. I don't need to read those. Um, it's important to have lots of different materials though, because the more materials we have, the more we can engage in some of the kinds of strategies we're gonna talk about a little bit later. Um, it also raises the cognitive and language ante a bit when we have more materials to work with. Um, so what are the different ways to make pancakes? Well, there's a traditional way. Um, you know, there's the clean way, and that's the, where the teacher or the teacher assistant actually makes the pancakes, right? Then nobody else gets any batter on them. That's always a good bet. However, uh, I think you understand kids like to get their fingers in this stuff. So uh, if we had uh, kids with a range of disabilities and interests, attention, et cetera. What are other ways to make pancakes? So we could make them in a blender, in a shaker, using a whisk, using a beater, a spoon. They can be frozen. I just had some of those yesterday morning. Uh, they could be pre-mixed. What, what can you learn in the course of uh, an activity like pancakes? And uh, this a lower half, by the way, if you haven't engaged in this kind of uh, activity planning, is, uh, is helpful sometimes to administrators, particularly if your administrators are preschool to grade 12 or or K to 12 special ed supervisor who doesn't really have a background um, in early childhood education. Uh, and some parents who also wanna, you know, wonder, who are wondering, what are my kids learning? It just looks like play to me, or it looks like making pancakes. So in this particular case, we've gone to the trouble of looking at all of the different objectives that could be addressed for any number of children within this pancake activity. If the, the activity was approached thoughtfully and with some pre-organization about how to address some of these skills. Um, so once again, I don't I don't have to uh, uh, I don't have to uh, delineate each one of these, but you can see there's a, there's 11 or 12 domains of uh, development that can be addressed. Um, and for certain kids, you might want to focus more for kids with more significant disabilities on some of the fine motor, gross motor aspects, maybe some of the self help aspects. For some of the, um, the the kids who are more typically developing, you know, reading through sight words, recipes, rebus recipes. Uh, baby science with respect to, you know, transformation, the introduction to physics, things like this. Um, don't don't get hung up on balancing eggs, however. That's not going to work out for you until I think it's June 21st, so we missed that. But I think you get the drift here. Um, to the extent that this kind of planning might be helpful for your partner teacher to see the richness of her curriculum. So she becomes more sensitive and aware of the things that she can address, including IEP objectives, if once again, she just sort of drills down a little bit deeper on some of the things she does now. Next slide, please. And as Lori said, any any comments or whatever you have questions, just raise them as we go along. Next. Susie, I don't think I can move the, um, can you move, can you do the, um, there we go. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, as we as we look, uh, we're going to go to the next slide, but not now. And we're actually going to look at a curriculum planning matrix. Um, these are the basic elements in the matrix. We have objectives with core competencies. In this case, Arizona Department of Education early learning standards, or whatever um, particular benchmark you're using. We link IP objectives with daily routines and activities. We then provide guidance on how to instruct or intervene to address these IP objectives that guidance is provided to our partner. And we also can provide additional guidance, which would be you know, of a very high level of, of uh, matrix planning, but we can provide guidance on how the partner teacher might monitor or evaluate the child's progress uh, in attaining this particular IP objective. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Um, we have some curriculum planning matrices in the folders on the site. We may drop a, in the, on the Edmodo site. We may drop a few more in there, but just once again to refresh your memory from webinar one about this particular planning tool, um, it is it is the row column cell um, box based matrix uh, on the far left in the first column on the far left. Uh, we, we would identify the child's IP objectives. In this case, child A has an objective identified in each one of the two boxes, and they're linked to a, uh, a typical child learning objective from the Arizona uh, early learning standards. Um, then across the top, we've identified five different a uh, aspects of the curriculum, typical uh, routines or times during the day that occur in this preschool classroom, whether this is half day or full day. Um, we then identify, in this case, uh, a few opportunities, as I think Lori and I mentioned the first go around, when we're starting out with a partner teacher who's naive uh, to the to consultation process, we would we would start with, with attempting to negotiate one activity during the week or during the day in which the child's IP objective can be addressed. And then we would gradually add other opportunities. We might never fill up each of the five boxes, but as we move from completing box one to box five, we can clearly see evidence of our progress in terms of curriculum planning and addressing IEP objectives. So under the five activities in conjunction with um, objective one, um, we see during arrival, the child can hang his coat in his cubby. And the objective is the child will select items and position in the classroom labeled with his first name. So it's a, it's a uh, you know, site recognition objective for, for at least at the entry level. Um, and the child will recognize his name um, uh, versus some of the other children in the classroom. So obviously his name has to be on the cubby. And we've, we've provided, we've suggested to the partner teacher that since he's in the acquisition phase and maybe having difficulty managing this, let's, let's give him a little bit of a cue and let's just color the first letter in his name red or do something to cause him to focus his attention on a letter that might differentiate his name. Let's call him uh, Eric. Uh, the E might differentiate his name from from uh, Donald uh, or from Charlotte. Um, so, you know, that's once again, just a little cue to start him down the road to recognition. Let's go down to uh, the art activity uh, where the kids in this case have a job box or an art supplies box or an art activity box, and it has each of their names on it. Um, in this particular case, we don't allow the child to simply walk up and grab a box. We put the box in such a location or restrict the access to the box, the teacher or teacher aid um, or parent. If we're talking about a home environment, the child has to point to the box, his box, by looking at the one that says Eric uh, uh, or seek assistance in securing his box from a number of other boxes that are out of reach. So we've added a little element of environmental engineering, and we'll talk in more detail about some of these strategies, limiting access, insufficient materials, unexpected events as we progress through the webinar. Um, the second objective is identifying two objects, um, determining which one is bigger, um, which one is smaller. And you can see uh, a couple of other activities uh, related to that. So what we've done here is taken our thinking, your joint negotiations with your partner teacher, if you're the consultant, whether you're the early childhood special ed teacher or the related services professional, we've taken our, our, our joint thinking and we've put it onto a two dimensional piece of paper. So during the 30 hours or so that you're not in that classroom, or whatever period of time it is, you're not standing next to your partner teacher. She can go to this matrix and refresh her memory on when she's going to address these IP objectives, what that IP objective is and how she's going to address the objective. Um, if you recall in the previous slide, and I hope you can because it wasn't that long ago, but I hope if you recall the previous slide, the fourth element would, have, would be to add a, uh, a suggestion for how she can keep track of the child's progress. We're not going to do that this week. We'll, we'll save that for webinar three, but I can see that uh, I, I think you can see where that's headed. We, we basically have a unified instruction or intervention plan that once again is an easy easy grasp of the partner teacher or parent if you're working in a home environment um, and of course those headers across the top change if we're at home and you know they might be laundry they might be getting ready for lunch they might be feeding the dog whatever um, those activities change but the, the the logic and the planning don't 
elegantly simple, the curriculum planning matrix, but, but essential in once again, transferring knowledge and skills to a partner teacher who does not have the same depth of understanding, experience or skill in the special education area. Next slide, please. OK, so as I mentioned, um, the CPMs, curriculum planning matrices, are useful because they provide visual guidance when you're not there. Um, so the teacher, once again, is not out there twisting in the wind. If she can't recollect what she's what she's supposed to do in, in the week in between your visit, she can refer to the matrix, which will give her um, a great deal of detail on when and how she can address this child's IP objectives. Next slide, please. And uh, this is important. And obviously the boxes uh, serve that purpose, don't they? That uh, they require us to briefly describe what the partner is supposed to do when she or he is addressing the target skill or behavior. Um, so, so that's a good thing. We don't, uh, you know, we have reams of loose leaf paper or spiral bound notes. We simply have a, uh, you know, two dimensional one or two page uh, pages in, in a, of a matrix that describe for the partner teacher um, what the strategy is that she can use when you're not in the classroom. Next slide, please. Um, and as we mentioned, when we get to that part about um, uh, recommending a, a monitoring strategy, this will also be useful to us uh, verifying implementation modality, which Lori will talk about later with respect to implementation checklists. But the, the brief uh, teaser at this point is, if we're going to go to the trouble of, of attempting to transfer knowledge and skills to our partner teacher so that she can become better at addressing a child's IP objectives, we need to set up uh, strategies and uh, structure so that we're fairly confident that our partner teacher is in fact delivering this specialized instruction correctly or with fidelity. Next slide, please. The uh, curriculum planning matrix process, and uh, Lori and I have mentioned this, and I will we'll continue to go back to it. While it might be tempting to develop your own curriculum planning matrix in the absence of your partner teacher, just because it might be more efficient with respect to time, it's a bad idea <laughs> because you lose the context uh, of what might be reasonable and realistic within the early childhood learning environment. Uh, and you also, um, uh, the your early childhood partner teacher doesn't have the opportunity to engage in the curriculum planning matrix development thinking, which is critically important. They begin to see opportunities and they begin to understand how they can take advantage of them. So once again, working together uh, and the, you know, earlier on in the consultation process, this is more uh, time intensive than it is later in the process, because once the partner teacher gets it with respect to the curriculum planning matrix, Future planning sessions, you know, can become much more focused, much quicker, and, and much more efficient. Next slide, please. So what are the benefits of the model? Um, we have indexed uh, priority IEP objectives to the daily schedule and routines. So, uh, you know, this is clear to everybody who wants to look at what's going on with the child. You know, it actually becomes your lesson plan, so to speak. Um, we can then identify incidental and direct teaching opportunities, instruction uh, strategies, which Lori will address here, or which we'll address here in a, in a bit. Um, and we link those opportunities, uh, those strategies with opportunities, which is what the matrix does. It helps the teacher understand not only is this how you can address the IP objective, this is when and where you can address that objective in a functional context where there's genuine learning and, and authentic experiences. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a particular uh, shout out to related services professionals, but it's also relevant to itinerants. Um, the use of a planning matrix also allows um, you to see complementary intervention. So while you may be delivering the primary intervention or therapeutic services, uh, I think we've had this conversation. I know we have, um, it always comes up. Is there anything that the, the early, uh, early childhood educator can do that would reinforce those particular skills, those motor skills, those language skills, those cognitive skills, um, that she won't be as efficient um, 
or insightful as you will be be as a result of your training experience, but with certain guidance and 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 the 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 benefit of having a curriculum planning matrix, she may be able to address some of these objectives and complement the child's development. And I don't mean by saying, which she should, by the way, but I don't mean by saying, you've really done a good job. I mean, complement in terms of adding additional opportunities for instruction. So I guess we could actually uh, have a tongue in cheek thing and that would be complementary and complementary. Uh, both of those would work. But that's an important point. The matrix allows therapists and intervention specialists to begin to see the opportunities where they can help the partner teacher identify uh, what she can do and when she could do it. And this will contribute to the general good with respect to addressing um, objectives that uh, maybe she isn't uh, uh, perfectly trained to, uh, to address on her own. Next, please. Yeah, um, the using a matrix over time, and I don't mean over years, I mean over a few opportunities. You, you do this matrix planning for two or three or four or five. You get up to doing this for about six kids. You're, you're pretty much knocking on the door of a skill set with respect to your your own, by the way, as well as uh, your partner teachers. Um, I have a, a, a very quick story about seeing multiple opportunities. Lori knows the story, but a grad student of ours years ago, I ran into her at a shopping mall and she said, Dr. Mack, how are you doing? I said, great, Mandy, how, how are things? She said, great. She said, but I hate you. And I said, well, what, what? I mean, what, what did I do? I mean, I, I wasn't sure she was smiling when she said it and I thought we got along pretty well. She said, I hate you because now I can't stop seeing all these opportunities for teaching. Um, you've made us go through all these activities and analyze them and now I just can't go through the day without seeing all. Now, of course she can't address all of them, which is part of the frustration. But at least she said, you know what? It's like second nature to me now. I see all kinds of opportunities to address these kids' IP objectives. So I think that's the good news. I think you can expect that to occur. I think week three of your consultation, um, when you get to week seven, and when then you get to week 14, I think you're gonna see a significant change in your partner teachers with respect to them becoming much more savvy, much more aware about how their curriculum is rich enough to address the needs of these children with IEPs and seeing opportunities to address those objectives. If anybody else has any personal testimony, like I said, just jump in or, you know, I'll take, I'll catch my breath for a second here as I move to the next slide. Bill, I was going to say that um, I wrote in the chat something that you were talking about earlier about um, incorporating um, home time, like activities at home, and you talked about um, feeding the dog or, you know, yeah. put, taking out the laundry. Um, yeah. You know, there are a lot of kids that are at home working at home right now, so this is a really great way to kind of bridge that divide between home and school and, yeah, um, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, good thing, Susie, that uh, unfortunately in these times, uh, you're right, that is, uh, that has uh, sort of become a cottage industry, hasn't it? Figuring out ways to have kids, uh, you know, have parents better understand how to address objectives now that their kids are home with them. Uh, let's hope it's not indefinitely. Um, there's two other ways to use that as well, is if you, you may have some parents who are actively interested in what can I do to help my child? This the use of a matrix tool is another really good way to give them some concrete examples about what they can do in the home that isn't, you know, didactic type teaching stuff where I bring the kid to the kitchen table, force him to sit there and we, you know, we do 20 trials. Not that kind of thing, but something more naturalistic. And of course, and the third thing is for those of you who are home visitors where you either have kids that are half day in school and you visit them, you know, in their homes half the other uh, one visit a week or some variation on the theme or you have some kids who are for one reason or another going to be spending some time at home that's not COVID related. You know, once this planning tool will work quite well, helping parents see opportunities within home structure. Um, uh, so yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Next slide, please. Yeah, and in addition to that, by uh, by engaging in this matrix planning act, uh, activity with your partner teacher, uh, you both will be able to discover, she, she may reveal to you, you may you may observe um, some of the things that motivate kids. And of course, as Lori pointed out earlier in the, in the webinar, uh, you know, that's what we always are looking for. We want we want to engage kids so they're motivated to demonstrate the skills and, and, and knowledge that um, 
our you know our our priorities for them in activities that uh, that that uh, once again are motivating for them. Um, we're not going to get much learning out of kids when we put them in activities that are not authentic, not genuine, remove them from their peer contact, um, and, um, you know, provide them with kind of cheesy consequences, uh, particularly in engaged in activities they're not interested in. Um, unfortunately, I just basically described the public school experience for too many kids, I think, but um, that's not our point tonight. But I think you get the idea. If we know that kids like to do stuff, they like to go to different centers, they like to carry certain things around, they like to interact with certain kids, that's good information. That's information that we should use to spur on motivation. Next slide, please. And uh, as I mentioned, we have some um, CPMs uh, in folders on Edmodo, and we'll uh, we'll drop a few more in there. Uh, Lori and I are willing to take a look at yours. If you're developing somewhere in the process, you want any feedback, um, you can either post them in the Edmodo site or send them as attachments to a, an email. We can take a look at them and uh, you know give you thumbs up or maybe give you some suggestions on how to refine certain aspects of it. But that's kind of an open invitation. Um, you know, this is. This is where the rubber hits the mo rubber hits the road. The curriculum planning matrix. This is where you know all of the uh, all the high level thinking uh, comes into play in terms of what it means to a partner teacher on on her day to day interactions with children. Next slide, please. So now, so after the matrix, um, I guess I should stop here and ask um, the participants if. Any of you have any questions about the matrix as a tool or anything you want to share about if you've had any uh, opportunity to use it at this point? Anybody? Right. Feel free to unmute and join in. Yeah. We should get this. Hi. The, uh... Hi. Hello. Hi. Um, I've not followed the exact matrix, but I do realize that the more I drill down, the easier it is for anybody in the room to figure out where my focus is for that child. Um, yes. I've had trouble kind of getting into that. Um, the, I'm sorry, Emoto. Is that how you're saying? Yeah. OK, yeah. So but I'd like to because I think that that would be very helpful for me uh, personally. Yeah. Well, hopefully, class. Catherine, we'll get over that hump. We'll get everybody in Edmodo. <laughs> and, One day. Uh, right? One day. Yeah, yeah. yeah Soon. It's, Soon but I can see. Yeah. yeah. I could see that it it's it makes it easier. Um, yes. It makes Absolutely. you more focused for the child. So. You know, it, it's um, it's a it's a it's a mental template, so to speak. It it helps people think on you know parallel, so to speak. Um, you know, every, with your partner, you begin to see things the same way. You have the same frame of reference, literally in this case, like the matrix. So uh, uh, it's a good way to uh, sort of centralize or focus our interactions with our partner teachers. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. Thank you. So uh, after the matrix, um, we have to uh, identify, uh, and after we've gone the trouble of matching the uh, IEP objectives with typical routines and activities, the next question is. What teaching strategy would be a good fit in addressing this child's um, IEP objectives within this particular activity or routine context? Um, and as I, I sort of already threw a bone down on the, the last point there about a challenge for some children with disabilities and, and have more, a more difficult time engaging with that pancakes activity. Um, just another way to see things. It's not a zero sum game. It's not an all or none like every kid has to participate in every activity in exactly the same way. I mean, we have to sort of liberate ourselves and free ourselves up a little bit and understand that that's not going to happen for some kids who have you know, significant autistic behavior or have uh, limited uh, uh, time on task, some kids who have sensory impairments, some kids who have physical impairments, et cetera. Um, but we still have to look at inclusion and we have to look at ways that all kids can participate in meaningful, um, in meaningful ways, but not necessarily in the same way. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, so we, um, I, I came in on the tail end of the, uh, somebody was identifying DEC and um, in any event, we threw this up in slide or webinar one and here it is again in webinar two. What we're talking about is absolutely consistent with the Council for Exceptional Children Division of Early Childhood recommended practices. So, you know, we, we, try, to, we try to create environments that emphasize access, participation and learning within and across activities and routine. We embed our special education focused instruction within these routines, activities, environments. We do not create a parallel universe. We don't, we don't create inclusive classrooms where half of the kids have a different curriculum than the other half. All the kids are in the same pot and we just figure out ways once again to stir it a little slower in some areas, a little faster in others, but um, you know, all the ingredients get put together. Uh, and the last piece here about using uh, instructional strategies that are research-based uh, with fidelity. Next slide, please. So uh, step five, identifying appropriate teaching strategies. How do we engineer the environment? How do we look at the environment? How, how do we match strategies and, and environmental engineering so that we can address children's IP objectives? Um, so, you know, one thing we do is we set up learning opportunities within these daily routines and we use several uh, uh, incidental um, and, you know, we point out that they're technically called incidental teaching strategies, not accidental. Because sometimes we have had people say it's accidental. It's not accidental. It's incidental. Um, um, we, although, you know, every now and then you back into something, right? Literally and figuratively in some of your classrooms. <laughs> but uh, but uh, we're talking about uh, a little less than, than uh, direct intensive instruction. Other ways we can address IP objectives on the sly. And we'll talk about those in a little more detail. Uh, using specific hey, evidence. Oh, yeah, Bill. Lori. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to um, interrupt, which I did. Um, and I, I think, you know, identifying, talking about accidental versus incidental, I think it's yeah. a really important point. Um, many times in educators talk about, well, I'm just going to capitalize on the teaching moment. And that's great. But in a, a lot of times, um, especially for kids with disabilities, you can't just um, assume that there's going to be a teaching moment. Uh, for many, many kids, you have to create teaching moments where children have the opportunity to become engaged in something, they pay attention because something's different, something's novel, um, something is particularly interesting to them. So, so when we talk about identifying, you know, setting up opportunities, we're we're talking about going beyond just capitalizing on the moment. We're talking about about you know creating opportunities um, for children to become interested. Mm -hmm. That's it. Good point. Um, yeah, and then and then parlaying on that, identifying naturally occurring uh, consequences or or um, outcomes of of for children when they engage in appropriate behavior or, or demonstrate um, priority skills. So, um, you know, when a little kid who has some fine motor planning problems, some apraxia type problems, pours himself a little bit of juice from a little tiny container, the natural consequence of that is um, that you get to drink the juice. That's what we all pour our juice for. Um, it's not that somebody takes the juice away and says, good boy, um, that's not the deal, right? We want naturally occurring consequences to the extent that they can. Uh, and that includes social consequences with respect to peers commenting on, um, you know, the uh, the skills of, of the, uh, their peers who have special needs. Next slide, please. Okay. Hey, Bill, um, we have a, a comment in the chat that says that it's all about intention. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, we're 150% behind that, okay? Um, intention is the driver. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the planning and the like. And the key is like everything else, planning is absolutely essential, but the execution is, you know, where the learning lives. So uh, yeah, in, intention is intention is a very good thing. And, you know, in the bigger picture, the scaffold for the consultation, that's clear too. All of these consultation type skills we talk about are, are predicated by intention. We want to systematically 
use certain strategies to engage our partner teachers, to support our partner teachers, and to make our partner, you know, the outcome is our partner teachers are more confident and, and competent in their skills when, when we're, you know, as we move along in this relationship. And we do that with, you know, intention. So yeah, um, all kids are motivated as we are, uh, learn best um, when they're interested. Um, RB, research-based intervention, relies on finding teachable moments, which Lori just talked about. Uh, and uh, savvy adults find ways uh, to entice children into a learning uh, into learning opportunities. Next slide, please. So speaking of um, methods of enticement, uh, some of these incidental teaching strategies, uh, you know, there's always the uh, asking direct open ended question. There's a there's a, a time and a place for that. Offering choices is often neglected um, in preschool classrooms. Um, for many, many reasons. In some cases, that's control. It's environmental control that um, some teachers prefer to limit choices just because it, uh, in, you know, it manages chaos in some respects. Um, yeah, you know, you know how it is with your own kids or, or the like. You give them a few opportunities and they're going to exercise their options, right? But in the case, in situations where we're trying to encourage kids to engage socially, you know, to make cognitive um, uh, decisions to engage in motor activities, choices reinforce that. Choices provide opportunities to demonstrate those skills. Uh, a couple of the activities that uh, come under the incidental teaching umbrella, uh, one of them is limiting access, and uh, it, it means exactly what it says. What we do is we don't necessarily give kids everything they want exactly when they need it, and we don't leave things where kids can get them without using language skills or motor skills or engaging peers as mediators to get those. And why don't we do that? Well, um, we don't do it because um, I'm trying to think of the song. Uh, it, may, it may come to me. We, we don't do it be, because there's learning in between the child wanting something and the child getting something. That learning might entail language. It might entail social engagement, some interacting with peers to get something that the child can't reach, the child can't open, some negotiation. Um, putting things children like or children need in order to uh, participate in activities in certain kinds of containers that the occupational therapist said um, are good for addressing the kinds of fine motor skills this child needs to work on. Uh, we're limiting access. We're not just leaving the, the crayons right out on the table. The crayons are in a, you know, a, a plastic ice cream container with a screw lid. It might not be on there like, uh, you know, deadlock tight, but it might be on there enough that this kid's got to do that little wrist rotation two or three times to get that cap off. So I remember the song now. I think the, the it's it's in the Wayback Machine. The uh, I, I believe the, uh, the songwriter was Nick Lowe, and it was called... Um, you got to be cruel to be kind if that rings a bell to some of you, OK? I don't mean it literally. I just mean you don't want to be a soft touch. You don't want the kids to know they can get anything they want just by simply, you know, evidencing a bit of annoyance or threatening a bit of annoyance. Um, you, you need to. And that's uh, what Patsy said. Patsy's, Patsy thought the song you were talking about, you can't always get what you want. Yeah, Suzanne said, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> there you go. We got a whole bunch of them. Right, right. Um, but, you know, Lori recognizes this is a speech language therapy strategy. Yeah, but, you know, Lori, you're going to point. I'll let you point this out about, you know, when the limiting access does become, uh, you know, a little too uh, too much. So, yeah, think about it. Um, if you're going to limit access, um, use that as a strategy. You have to use it specifically. So think about the kid that never has access to anything they want or need. Um, what kind of message does that send? And what kind of um, what kind of complex does that um, have the um, possibility of occurring for a kid? The other thing is. If you're going to do that, limiting access to toys or food or activities, it needs to be the same across all the kids in the classroom. So it can't just be for Sarah, that Sarah's the one who needs to ask for stuff um, and everybody else can just, you know, they don't have to ask. So be careful when you use strategies like this because 
um, they can send some unintended messages that you don't want to. Um, there's also the cultural aspect of it. If you're offering kids just a little bit of something, particularly if it's food, um, children who come from homes where food insecurity is an issue may not ask for more food, even though they want it, because they're, they've been you know, trained or raised to believe that there's not always enough to go around. So, you know, think about that carefully and use these kinds of strategies very sensitively. Yeah. Um, but I had, I had an interesting conversation this um, last week. Um, yeah, last week. We, I did a webinar for our, some of our graduate students on one of our grants, and I said, so what are some of the good things that have come out of COVID? Um, and change your change the way you're teaching and a couple of them said well now the kids all have tubs that they put all their own individual materials in and they said I really like them being able to use tubs and it, it didn't occur to me at the time but you know uh, the next day I was thinking about that and I thought, well, that might make it a lot easier for the teacher, and um, it might make things go a lot smoother. But what are some of the problems with that when children have access to their own sets of materials that they can use? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and another example of limiting, limiting access to, to, to sort of uh, give you a uh, a similar example of Lori's concerns about uh, not singling kids out. We could have we could have goldfish for snack. Um, and this little girl here in the photo, let's suppose this little girl needs some pincer grasp training or polymer grasp, depending on what the occupational therapist says. Um, we could provide each of you, know, maybe there's four or five kids at the table. We could provide them each with a different kind of a tool to get those goldfish crackers out of a small bowl. You know, two of the kids might have a spoon. Two two kids who are completely motorically functional um, can, could have could have two uh, could have a spoon. Uh, another child might be able to use his fingers. I don't know. And this little girl here, we might provide her with some you know pretty flexible little tongs. You know, little two inch tongs or whatever fat tongs. So she'd have to you know pick the things up one at a time. She's not really being singled out. Um, and you know, th this is this is an alert teacher, right? Who's figuring, yeah, see, I'm a little bit of sleight of hand here. I'm actually 32, and these kids are four, so the odds are pretty good on a given day I can kind of fool them. Um, and you know, so that's kind of the issue Lori's talking about. It wouldn't just be this little girl with the tongs. We might engineer engineer it so we fooled them all into thinking this was just some little game we played, which they might enjoy, quite frankly, right? Typically do. Um, uh, another uh, incidental teaching strategies, uh, incomplete activities or insufficient materials. You know, that would be some, we, we might be at the, the table once again, and uh, each of the kids has uh, a little tray with four different colors, but one kid's missing red. Um, and, you know, we go to paint and then the teacher says, okay, um, can, can we, would anybody want, can we put red on the paper or something? And, you know, he or she would look and they would then have to be prompted. First of all, it's a cognitive issue, right? I, I don't have red. I have to recognize the yellow, the blue, the green. I'm missing red. And then that little person might have to ask, okay? Or, you know, raise their head up with a quizzical look about, I, I don't have red or no red, no got red. Um, but, you know, this wouldn't be every time she sat at the art table. <laughs> um, but you get the idea. So, you know, we... We game things up a little bit to encourage and motivate those kinds of behaviors, motor behaviors, thinking behaviors, language behaviors. Uh, insufficient uh, materials as well. You know, let's say we're putting some beads together and we've got six of these fat beads or, or we're doing some um, Lego type things. And, you know, one of the kids is a couple of Lego short, um, you know, insufficient materials. The way to solve that is to say, hey, I need more or I need yellow or I don't have it or some variation. Unexpected events are the kind of things many of you do. You're reading a story and you read it wrong or you read it silly. And what that does for some kids, it creates cognitive dissonance because they know that's not right. You read it wrong or that's not how it goes. You know, creating unexpected events can trigger language and also can trigger thinking. Um, 
uh, I'm not going to burn up more time here, but he, an unexpected event during my career, which ended up okay for me, which could have gone very badly, was I was teaching a grad course. I'm going to say it was 25 years ago. I don't know. I had two young daughters at the time, uh, and it's a night class. It was 4.30 or 7 o'clock class, whatever. These are 20, um, many of them teachers working on master's degrees or ed specialists, uh, another handful working on teacher credentials uh, at the grad level. And I I put my hand in my pocket to take out my handkerchief and just out of the corner of the eye, my eye as that handkerchief came up toward my cheek, I realized it was purple or or hideous yellow or something. And it, it wasn't a handkerchief. It was one of my daughter's panties. So <laughs> I uh, I quickly threw that thing back in my pocket and I'm, I'm amazed. I got through that thing like I was, you know, some stand up comedian, no trouble at all. Never called any attention to it. Nobody ever said a word. So uh, that's the good news. <laughs> Otherwise, I could be doing 25 years now for all I know. But uh, so that was an unexpected event. You get the idea. And commenting ex and expansion, which I'm sure that your speech pathologists have shared with you in ways of encourage uh, more sophisticated forms of language or better repetition of language or more language volume. So once again, how to entice kids into in, into uh, uh, in, engagement and also demonstrating skills and, and behaviors. Next slide, please. Yeah, so how do we implement incidental teaching? Setting up the environment, waiting for the learners to initiate the request, responding with a request for elaboration where that's appropriate, and continuing the prompt if the, the skill the child demonstrate isn't, isn't uh, an approximation of what we'll accept. Um, so the incidental teaching strategies merely trigger the opportunity to teach, but they're good. They're good little tools and uh, they can be a lot of fun. Next slide. So what happens after the kids take the bait? Um, what do we do? Well, we, we watch and listen to what the child's doing or saying. Um, we engage with the child. We wait for the opportunity to provide the support and it, at which point it's appropriate, that point where the child uh, is, is having difficulty continuing with the skill or, 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 or shaping the skill or behavior in, in such a way that it is appropriate. Um, we provide some kind of prompting to maintain their uh, engagement or shape their behavior and always providing some encouragement or consequence uh, that once again is consistent with what the child, uh, uh, what motivates the child. So, yeah, you know, once we set the kids up with these, uh, these enticers, these incidental teaching strategies, um, we have to be ready to respond appropriately when the child takes the bait. Um, and we also have to be able to respond appropriately if they don't take the bait. So I think a lot of times, you know, we've set up these uh, things. OK, I'm just going to give them, you know, a little bit of juice or a little bit of water for snack, hoping that they're going to ask for more. If they don't ask for more, then you basically have lost that opportunity, which isn't necessarily tragic or anything. It just means you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. But I think you have to be really careful at making sure that you don't try to change a child directed activity into something that's on your agenda. Um, you know, it doesn't mean that you follow kids around saying, don't you want more water? Don't you want more water? Um, say water, because then all of a sudden it's not based on children's interests. It's based on your own agenda. Yeah. Although once again, in context in Arizona, Lori, that some of these guys may have to chase kids around and ask, don't you want more water? <laughs> <laughs> Next slide and you're up. <laughs> there you go. Okay. So, so, you know, what we've really been talking about, again, kind of going back, um, we've prioritized the IEP objectives that we want to address, talked about ways that you can plan how to address them within the child's daily routine. And then this next step is thinking about what are the types of intervention strategies? What do you say or what do you do to help children respond appropriately? And this is kind of where, um, for those of you who are in special education, or related services, this is where your professional hat comes on. 
where you think about those strategies that you learned in graduate school or learned in undergrad, your undergraduate teaching program, um, evidence-based teaching strategies that have shown, been shown to be effective in helping children or helping students um, perform or develop the skills they need to develop. So these are just some of the examples that you might want to think about. Next slide, Susie. So this is a really interesting chart. At least it's interesting for me. Um, and this comes out of a book chapter that Willary wrote um, to the way back uh, in 1993 when he talked about embedding different intervention strategies in children's daily routine. And the point that he was trying to make is that you always, that, that what's important is for you to think about the simplest types of intervention strategies that are likely to elicit the kind of response that you want to elicit. Because when you, when you um, try out those really, um, you know, kind of um, loose, or very naturalistic intervention strategies, you're really helping to promote child-directed learning. As you start implementing more structured intervention strategies, you're becoming a little bit more, I don't wanna say heavy-handed, but I guess I just did. You're becoming more teacher-directed, um, which is okay sometimes, but you want to, Looks like we lost Lori there for a second. Yep. I see her phone still there. Let me call her real quick. She's calling back in. Oh, okay. It, it looks like her number's not there anymore. She'll text me in a second. There's a problem. She got kicked. She'll be in in a second. Um, let's see here. Well, I'm looking at the chart and it yeah. shows on the left hand side probability of child initiated behavior going from low to high. So as you determine um, where the uh, if it's likely that um, the child will initiate it or unlikely, you would have different, um, you know, approaches. And then probability of producing specific child behavior, if that's high or low. Um, hey guys. My internet just went off. Um, so I'm really sorry. It'll probably come back on. Um, yeah, can we can you hear you now. Okay, all right. Can, Bill, can you go through those slides while I'm trying to get back on? Sure. Um, yeah, this slide, by the way, requires somebody, you, you have to sit back with a cup of coffee and look at it carefully. Uh, as, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, really. As it goes from southwest to northeast and northwest to southeast, um, <laughs> looking along the bottom from low to high, um, you, you know, you have the uh, extent of control. So uh, it, it's a, you know, um, it's really a, a, an elegant um, conversation here about, you know, how do you decide what's the effect of your intervention strategies? But um, it's almost an entire seminar in itself. Um, Mark Woolery was a very smart guy and it was really nice of him to put all this together. So um, yeah, I would I would encourage you to, uh, you know, um, right now we can't get caught up in the details, but I would encourage you to uh, take five minutes, sit someplace, put your feet up and take a look at that. See if it makes any sense to you. Next slide. Um, Lori, at this point, Lori was going to talk about the um, these modules, which are available online. They're 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 a firm. That's the acronym: Autism Focused Intervention Resource Modules. Uh, the key feature is while they were developed uh, to address the needs of young children with autism, uh, they generalize across all children with special needs and children in general. Um, the uh, you can access this online if you're not familiar with the uh, firm modules. 
and um, there all you need to do is log in the usual story. You get a you you get a password and you're good to go. And there are a number of different teaching guides, so to speak, um, which address implementation checklists and um, these kinds of issues about what particular strategies are appropriate for what types of behaviors and skills. And uh, once again, it is balanced. It does take into account the characteristics of the child, et cetera. So uh, a firm is, and, is you, you back? Go ahead. I, yeah, well, I'm not back, but I, yeah. I just pulled up the, my version of the slideshow. And so you're um, on 31. Are you, you're on 30. OK, great. So um, yeah, things like the Affirm site, um, if you're anything like me, you might need a little refresher about, okay, I remember hearing about um, backwards chaining or graduated guidance, um, but I can't remember the, all the basic steps. Um, these sites, the site like the Affirm website is really great because it gives you um, a description uh, a very operational description of how to use different intervention strategies that can be really helpful. So can you go to the next slide, please? Yep. Um, and when you're choosing intervention strategies, um, and this was some of the information that was available at the Affirm site, one of the things that you want to choose or you want to think about are how to choose um, how to think about characteristics of the child or characteristics of the family in choosing intervention strategies. So if you have, um, you know, if you have a, um, you're working with a preschooler who's like my grandson Theo uh, at three and a half and gets, um, maybe has a short fuse sometimes and doesn't have a lot of patience with himself, you might want to take that into account when you're choosing an intervention strategy. Um, if you have a kid that's very easygoing and is um, motivated, clearly motivated by a lot of things, you might want to take that into account. You might want to think about what has or hasn't worked in the past at the home or at school and what might be particularly challenging for the child. Next, next slide. Can you put up the next slide, Susie? Yeah, she's up, 30, 33. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm <laughs> trying to do this. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Um, um, so you might, another, um, another thing, another consideration when you're choosing intervention strategies is to think about what kinds, um, what is the goal or the outcome? What are you trying to achieve? And how does that, um, influence the intervention strategy. So for example, are you trying to influence the child's fluency, speech or language fluency? Are you trying to um, really emphasize a particular skill? And thinking about that can really help you think about the intervention strategy to use. Um, next slide. Yep. 34. Um, the, the teacher, the, the characteristics of the teacher or the teaching team um, may have an effect on the different type of intervention strategy that you use. What's the knowledge and skill level of the teachers that you're working with? Um, are there evidence-based practices that other teachers and team members have used? And could you use the same ones? Next slide. Here's some other things that you might want to think about. Um, other resources, to, are, is there, are there the supports that you need? Um, is, do you need additional equipment? Do you need additional people or resources? What other learning experiences occur or are available at the school that would be beneficial in achieving this goal? So for example, you know, if the, if the child um, really needs to focus on expressive communication, are there um, things happening at the school or in that child's life that you can use as learning opportunities? Next slide. By the way, um, you know, the, this uh, focus on affirm modules is not specifically for your benefit, but rather a resource that you can use 
to help your partner teachers better understand some of the more basic special education instruction strategies. Okay, so I'm back on, my internet came back on. Uh -huh. um, so this is just a screenshot, again, of, on the Affirm website. Um, when you're talking about using evidence-based practice, this chart shows you um, the specific different kinds of evidence-based practice and um, the degree to which they have research support based on children's ages and developmental domain or developmental area that you're trying to address. So um, check out that Affirm website when you have a chance. Next slide. And they're, um, all free. they're free too. Laura. And they're all free. Yes, they're all free. You yeah. already paid with them for your tax job by, with your tax dollars. Um, so go ahead and use them. Yeah. Um, I don't think we general, have time right now. Our general suggestion is before you do something, um, create something yourself, look around and see what's there. And a firm would be a good place to go. Yeah, my gosh, there's so many different resources out there now that are just terrific. So um, look at, you know, take a look at some of those. Um, when you're drinking that cup of coffee or um, a beverage of your choice and you're looking at the webinar, ch check out the um, short video that uh, talks about selecting evidence-based practices with Sam. Uh, it gives you an example of how the team went through that process. Next slide. Um, so number step number six, and we're not going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about it at our next webinar. But step number six um, focuses on identifying the progress monitoring strategy that you want to use, that the team wants to use to, in order to document whether or not the intervention strategy is making a difference for the child. Next slide. Um, yep, and there will be, um, in webinar three and we'll post files on the Edmodo site. Next slide. Whoops. Whoops. So this next step, we're getting kind of close to the end. Um, you've identified different types of learning opportunities that you think would be good um, to address a child's IEP goals or objectives. You've identified intervention strategies. You've figured out um, progress monitoring strategy, the, the next step is helping your partner teacher uh, learn how to use those intervention strategies that you've identified as, um, as probably effective for the child. So this next part is all about coaching. Next slide. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about implementation checklists. And, um, you know, implementation checklist is um, really a fancy term for um, just writing out the to-do list. It's a printed sequence of steps or procedural components of a specific strategy. And I don't know about you, um, you know, Bill tells his story uh, about um, seeing opportunities. I always think about the fact that, um, I'm, I'm terrible with technology until I've had the chance to kind of practice it. So, um, you know, we just had a pool put in our backyard um, two years ago now, and I could never remember how to turn the heat up on the pool. Um, I, re I knew that you had to turn the temperature up on the heater, um, but I would always forget that in addition to doing that, you had to um, change something, you had to push another button, um, which was um, putting the, the pool cycle in overdrive. Uh, my husband would be able to tell you, but I have no clue. Um, but basically, what I could do is write down those steps. And once I wrote them down, and once I had them in front of me, it was really easy for me to remember what to do. In fact, it got so easy that I didn't need that printed checklist. I didn't need that to-do list in front of me anymore. I could do it by myself. But it's really important. Again, what we're trying to do is think about tools that early childhood teachers, child care providers, parents can use 
when special ed professionals or related service providers are not around um, to help do that, to help um, teach or to help coach. So those implementation checklists can really serve as a reminder to adults of the important steps in an intervention strategy that's going to help adults, help um, those teachers implement interventions with fidelity. And, you know, um, fidelity is a huge buzzword in the field right now. We acknowledge the fact that um, different intervention strategies work if they're implemented in the way that they're supposed to be implemented, right? So um, me turning, trying to um, turn up the heat on the pool, I know you guys in Arizona would try to turn the heat down, um, but in Northwest Ohio, we try and make the pool a little bit warmer. Um, it wasn't enough. I couldn't say, no, it must be broken because I turned the thermometer up, but nothing happened. Well, that's because I didn't do all of the steps. So mm -hmm. making sure that there's a way to support teachers or to support learners so that they remember all the steps is a really important part of this process. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about those characteristics or features of effective checklists, there are a couple things to remember. The first is that it's really important to identify the key steps of a specific intervention strategy. So, for example, making sure that you get a child's interest or get their attention before you prompt a response. Um, that's really, really important because unless you do that, especially for young children, you know that they may not be paying attention. And so, you know, an adult, a family parent might say, well, I tried to do it, but nothing happened. Well, that's because the kid wasn't paying attention when you were trying to, um, you know, giving them this prompt. The other thing that you have to remember is that it's really important to use language that's really easy to understand. And, you know, that's why terms like successive approximations um, or contingent upon um, may be helpful when we're using, when we're talking about those strategies in a formal matter, manner, but they can be really um, serve as a barrier to implementation if um, the person that you're working with doesn't understand what they are. So, you know, for example, that's why, you know, my husband basically had to say, well, you know, turn the system into overdrive or something. He was much more effective if he just said, press that yellow button when after you turn the thermometer on, because it was a lot more simple for me to understand. Okay, next slide. Here's an example of an implementation checklist. Uh, and we'll post some implementation checklists in the Edmodo site. We also have a, an article that we wrote for one of the DEC monographs that we'll post into the, um, on the Edmodo site about using implementation checklists. This is an implementation checklist that focuses on how to use constant time delay to help the child do something or say something. In this case, it's um, helping a child engage with a peer. So if you see down towards the bottom in the table, um, it gives you the steps that you would follow. Number one, observe the child with his or her peers. Um, number two, if that child appropriately asks the peer for an object, give them positive and descriptive praise or reinforcement. So say, good job, Nolan, you asked Gavin for the car. Um, if they don't respond, um, if they don't ask correctly, or if they don't, um, don't respond, then it's time to implement the different strategy that you have. I'm trying to, um, Susie, can you change, or, or I guess that's as far as it goes. Um, in this, in this example, and you'll see the whole example in the Edmodo site, it gives um, each one of the steps that you should use to mm -hmm. use constant time delay mm -hmm. and can serve as, again, a checklist for being able to, um, yep, that's okay. Don't worry about it. 
if you could just go back, this is another implementation checklist, um, again, from one of the different sites. Yeah, it's from, it's a peer mediated intervention and that's from um, Affirm modules. Mm -hmm. Right, the, okay, I thought it was from the Affirm module. So yeah. next slide. You know, before we, before we jump there, the, the beauty of that last slide is that strategy is something that would be appropriate for probably the, um, you know most of the partners you're working with and is used across multiple kids so you only have to download that or generate that kind of task analysis once you don't have to do the same thing for every kid you start to build a war chest so to speak of some basic fundamental special education teaching strategies and you share those among the team members mm -hmm. okay um the the ECTA Center um, has a uh, great resource. They have uh, different implementation checklists. Oh, my internet, okay. Different implementation checklists that are based on DEC's recommended practice. Um, next slide. Hey, Lori, you don't have to rush through this. You're okay. Take your time. Okay. All right, good. Um, the Autism Internet Modules, which is part of OCALI, um, and Ohio, the Ohio Center for Autism and Low Incidence, is another site um, that provides you with implementation checklists. Uh, you have to register to use the Autism Internet Modules, but um, it, it, they just need to, they just want to keep track of who's using them. Um, again, they have um, different types of implementation checklists along with um, modules, learning modules on how to use different intervention strategies. Uh, don't let the term autism fool you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we know about kids with disabilities, kids with autism have difficulties with communication, but so do other kids. Um, kids who just have language delays or kids who have cognitive delays. Um, you don't just have to have autism or be interested in kids who have autism to use the autism internet module. Next slide. Another source is the Affirm site, and that's the one that Susie had flashed up on the screen. Um, again, these are really, really helpful. The only um, beef that I have with these implementation checklists, especially the Ocali ones and the Affirm ones, is the terminology that they use in them is very, very technical. Uh, and so you may have to translate them. You may have to make up your own um, implementation checklist using those as a model, but using simpler terminology to make it easier to understand and easier to adopt. Mm -hmm. Next slide. So how do, how do we recommend you using an implementation checklist? So as part of the coaching process, what we think, um, what we'd like to see you do is to review that implementation checklist with your partner, making sure that everybody understands all of the terms and all of the language. The next thing that you would do is to ask your partner teacher, whether it's an early childhood teacher, it's a, um, another educator that you're working with, it's a family member, ask that person to observe you while you're using the intervention strategy and then check off when they see you, see you use each one of those procedural components. So when they see you getting that child's attention, they'll check that off. And when they see each one of those parts, they'll check that off and then repeat that until your partner can get correctly identify all of the components. Next slide. Um, and then and then you may want to um, allow your partner to give you some performance feedback based on her use of the checklist. Well, I saw you do this. Um, I saw you do that. Those kinds of things. The next thing that you would do is to switch roles and let your partner try out the intervention strategy with you providing performance feedback using the checklist. And use this back and forth process, um, providing performance feedback until both of you feel confident 
in your ability, in your partner's ability to use and implement that intervention strategy when you're not around. And the, in, and the developing an implementation checklist or downloading as is or editing is, uh, serves the same function as having a curriculum planning matrix. That implementation checklist stays with your partner teacher. So on any given day, if she's going to be using that strategy with a kid and she can't quite remember what step three was, she has the implementation checklist to refer to. Can laminate it, put it up on the bulletin board, um, put it in really big print, um, put it above, you know, so the children at, a, at adults eye level. So it's something that's there um, and something that is a cue for the teacher. Yeah. Next slide. Um, again, like we said, we'll be posting examples of implementation checklists as well as via the paper we wrote in the Edmodo site. Yeah. Has anybody ever used an implementation checklist? I know some folks who um, work more in um, ABA, um, applied behavior analysis. I've talked to some folks who have used that. Um, I wonder if anybody here with us today has used that. It's, it's also a very similar comparable to a task analysis, which if any of you at any time in your careers have worked with older kids or even, uh, even adults with disabilities, that's a common tool is to break down a big skill into smaller sub skills or subset. So that's basically what an implementation checklist is, a sequential beginning to end sequence uh, of how to, uh, um, in, in this case, use this uh, evidence-based practice with fidelity. And it, right. the, the curriculum planning matrix as the planning tool, the implementation checklist, you know, is is the other critical tool that will take your partner teacher, um, you know, from uh, the point where she understands when and how she can address the IP objective. The implementation checklist shows her exactly how she can go about doing that. Absolutely critical piece of uh, information. Next slide. Um, so, so we're also the next time we're going to talk a little bit more about how adults can sell, use self monitoring tools and strategies, but implementation checklists can also be used to as a um, as a self monitoring tool. Did I use constant time delay in the correct way? Did it, and and yes, I did this and being able to check off those boxes can really be helpful in terms of documentation. There's some other strategies as well that we'll talk with you about in November or just some November. Yeah. Next slide. Um, Bill, you want to go through? There's yeah, you know, actually, there's uh, we've only got about eight slides to to go and um, they're they're basically summarized read through kind of slides. So, um, you know, we can uh, pretty much um, roll it up here in the next two slides. And and, and Suzanne has uh, indicated that she'll hang out for a little bit and work um, work with some of the participants to get loaded up onto Edmo. But so, yeah, um, you know, to find our, our final summary with respect to uh, these tools and procedures and strategies is that um, engaging in a consultation relationship, consulting and hoping uh, is, is in effect is, is ineffective. That's been demonstrated by research, despite the fact that it intuitively makes common sense. We actually had people looked at the research outcomes. They're not good. So, you know, we go back 52 minutes in our webinar and somebody said intention is absolutely essential and we couldn't agree more. Next slide, please. So, yeah, that's what comes yeah. down to, um, you know, and we improve the odds of success by providing guidance and support to our partner teacher. So she can do, uh, she can address these IP objectives in our absence and with the, with the, the gift of time that she has with respect to opportunities to interact with the child, she can move the child along um, toward achieving these IP objectives. So, so a few, oh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to an itinerant teacher and um, asking, I was talking to a class and asking people um, what they did when they visited classrooms. And this person raised her hand and said, well, I'm an itinerant teacher and I model for the teacher what she, um, some good strategies to use with the child. 
And I said, that's great. I said, tell me more about that. Tell me about how you model. What's the teacher doing when you're modeling? And the itinerant teacher had a blank look on her face. And she said, well, sometimes she's fixing snacks or sometimes she's working with other kids. Um, The point of the story is if you're modeling, um, it means that somebody has to be watching. And when um, Diane, I think, um, reminded us about the importance of intentionality, that that's really key. You can't say that you're modeling or demonstrating for somebody just by hoping that they're watching you. Um, We really we really uh, recognize the fact that early childhood teachers are super busy and they need some uninterrupted time and explicit time to work with you um, and to work with others to really learn how to use those strategies. So it's not enough to, to say, oh, try, um, you know, getting the kid to talk more at dinner time or talk more at lunchtime. Um, it really requires being able to sit down and think through and talk through how to use those intervention strategies and making sure that the person you're trying to teach is is proficient at using those strategies. So now it's after 5.30, your time. Yep. That's... Um, and I think you probably have dinner to go to. Yeah. So, um, Suzanne, you, you said you'd stay online for a little bit? I will. Yeah. I, I have my screen up. I'm ready to, to model. All right. <laughs> See if anybody's watching. <laughs> well, good, good to talk to you guys tonight. We'll be uh, talking to you on the uh, follow-up sessions in the next couple of weeks. So keep the faith. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Bill right. and Lori. Yeah. Appreciate it. And I All right. Thanks, Suzanne. Thank you guys. Yeah. Right? Good night. Bye-bye.